Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Serena Longo, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm so pleased to introduce this virtual event with Jennifer Hochschild presenting her new book, Genomic Politics, joined in conversation by Evelyn Hammonds. Thank you so much for joining us virtually this afternoon. Harvard Bookstore's virtual event series continues this spring, bringing authors and their work to our community and our digital community. Find our event schedule at harvard.com slash events, where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and shop our shelves from home. This afternoon's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. We'll get through as many as time allows. This event will also have auto-generated closed captioning available. Depending on the version of Zoom you're using, you may need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. Uh, in the chat, I'll be posting links to purchase genomic politics on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like this afternoon's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you all for showing up and tuning in in support of authors, publishers, and indie book selling. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. Uh, and finally, as you have no doubt experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thanks so much for your patience and understanding. And so now I am delighted to introduce today's speakers. Jennifer Hawkshield is Henry Labar Jane Professor of Government, as well as African and African American Studies at Harvard University, and a former president of the American Political Science Association. She is also the author and editor of numerous books, including recently Do Facts Matter, co-authored with Catherine Levine Einstein, Creating a New Racial Order, co-authored with Vesla Weaver and Tracy Birch, and Bringing Outsiders In, co-edited with John Molenkopf. Joining Jennifer on our digital stage this afternoon is Evelyn Hammonds, Barbara Gutman Rosencrantz Professor of the History of Science and Professor of African and African American Studies at Harvard University. Today, they'll be discussing Jennifer's new book, Genomic Politics, How the Revolution in Genomic Science is Shaping American Society. Harvard Medical School's George Church calls it a superbly balanced and comprehensive guide. And E.J. Dion Jr. writes, genomic politics is an important achievement, a model of careful research, honest reflection, and political savvy. We're so pleased to be hosting this event today. The digital podium is yours, Jennifer and Evelyn. Thank you, Serena. It's wonderful to be here, and especially wonderful to be here with my dear colleague, uh, Jennifer Hochschild, a uh, longtime colleague, and uh, I've been such an admirer of all your wonderful work, uh, Jennifer. And so we're supposed to have a conversation today, so I'm just going to kick it off. Um, so the first question I think is an obvious one. Uh, why would a political scientist be interested in writing about uh, genomics? And, and why do you think uh, the general public should care what a political scientist has to say about <laughs> these things? Oh, well, my first answer is the obvious answer, which is why not? Everybody <laughs> ought to be writing and thinking about genomics. It's really important. Um, so I, I should say before plunging into a slightly more substantive response, I just want to thank you very much, Evelyn, and thank Harvard Bookstore. I'm thrilled to be talking about this book. It's, I've been working on it for a decade or more, and it, it's finally available for me to talk about. So thank you all. Um, I think there's two, well, the first thing I would say is that there are very few political scientists, in fact, working on genomics or even more generally science policy. So that is the right question. Um, I, of course, am hoping to proselytize. I think lots of us <laughs> ought to do lots more of it, but I can name on one hand the number of political scientists who are very fine scholars, but there aren't very many of us. Uh, and I think there's two uh, foundations for my interest. Um, one is a quote, which I'm going to read at least a bit of, 
I almost always, this really kind of inspired my thinking about this, but it also is kind of a setup for the whole project. And I hope for, for people listening, it comes from The Economist written in 2007. So even before, I, before even I started working on this project, they say there is in biology, a sense of barely contained expectations reminiscent of the physical sciences at the beginning of the 20th century. So, I mean, you're a historian of science. If you think back to physics, in 1920, sure. it was kind of just being invented. Uh, you know, Einstein, Schrodinger, Bohr, I mean, again, you, you can list the eminences more than I can, but one could not have predicted in 1920 most of what physics was going to do across the 20th century. Right, of course like, not, yes. Nuclear weapons, flights to the moon, I, you know, starting with them and going on forever and ever. So the economist says it's a feeling of advancing into the unknown, a recognition that where this advance will lead is both exciting and mysterious. The analogy between 20th century physics, 21st century biology will continue for both good and ill. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that in 2020, 100 years later, we're on the edge of something that's as unpredictable and important and earth changing, world changing, as physics was 100 years ago. Uh, and if that's true, we all ought to be studying genomics. Um, and oh, the other I thing I like about this quote is the both good and ill side. Right, because right. of course, oh, I think that's a really, I think that's an a, a, a excellent point. And you know, a historian of science is like to be able to talk about uh, how important physics was is always a great thing. It's also because I studied physics, but but I do think that I, I want to just I, I think you're right to bring to bring that to the fore. And part of it would be uh, what you started out by saying not many political scientists uh, write about uh, genomics, but they also, but, but also what you said is they don't write about science so much. Uh, and, and, and connect, so connected to this as you, as you open up, uh, you know, where you were coming from to get involved in this is, uh, hasn't the last 18 months told us something about the role of science and the importance of how American citizens understand and Play scientific knowledge um, hasn't hasn't what's happened shaken shaken or awakened us to to the need for more experts to be talking about these things. Boy, I certainly hope so. Um, I mean, he, he, if if anything was ever going to do that, the last eighteen months should have done so. Right. Uh, I mean, I've been reading. You know, I got I got into this reading sort of pandemic disaster books for the last eighteen months. So I've learned about the Black Death and the nineteen eighteen flu epidemic and. You know, and one of the things that we've discovered or that I've discovered in, in the last is partly nothing is any different. I mean, the people resisted wearing masks, people, really? you know, fought experts, people insisted on their home remedies yes. forever and ever and ever. Yes. But, but, it's, but, but it's also true that this time is a little bit different. We have expectations of both democratic engagement, but also serious governmental help. I mean, the government is supposed to, at least from the perspective of my, my ideology, not solve everything. It can't and shouldn't and better not mess with trying to do so, but contribute to societal wide solutions. And of course, the other thing we have is a vaccine. Right. And right. which, you know, the Black Death didn't have or the pandemic flu didn't have, you know. And so, the politics of both what is exactly the same as it's been historically forever and ever, and what is dramatically new, unprecedented, because of genomics, the vaccine is just totally fascinating. I will say that there are, I mean, I'm writing one and perhaps several articles with one of my wonderful graduate students about COVID and response to President Trump and the partisanship. And, you know, there's probably, 75 of us all writing more or less the same article. So maybe people have finally gotten the message. Right. I, I do want to say one other thing about the reason I got into this, which is a little more specific than the economist quote, if I may, um, okay. because it, it leads into the whole question of where the politics in this arena is. Exactly, exactly. So, so the first point about the economist is that this is so big, it's got to be involved in politics. I mean, it, it, they have, like, like physics. But the other is a, is a conference that I went to in 2007 or eight on Bidel, which I think you, I don't know that you were there, but I think you were- I wasn't there, but I know, I know a lot about it, yes. yeah. Yeah, um, so Bidel was um, a drug that was 
intended to be used for congestive heart failure. And again, there's a long story, which I, you know better than I do probably, but basically it was approved by the Food and Drug Administration for quote, um, prescription to quote, self-identified African-Americans or self-identified yeah. blacks. So when it happened is it, it, it the pharmaceutical uh, company had a license to uh, produce this drug and uh, that license was running out and it was gonna go generic, which of course it means less money for the pharmaceutical company. And what they wanted to do was they have to prove a different kind of use if you wanna ex extend the original license uh, and proprietary license for it. And so the new use that they proposed after some small number of studies was that it had a particular uh, at specific kind of uh, uh, efficacy for self-identified African-Americans. So I, I'm not a biologist. I had no knowledge of whether this was a, even a normalized statistician, plausible or absurd. Um, so I went to it was a conference and I think it was in Arlington and I sat in the back of the room and just tried to observe and hope nobody would notice. And most of the social scientists, perhaps all, certainly most said, this is really terrible. Mm -hmm. This is biologizing race in a crude, unacceptable, statistically mistaken, biologically mistaken, politically dangerous way. Right. What on earth is the FDA think it's doing? Right. This is very bad. Right. And then there was a table in the room with representatives from Howard University Medical School, from the National Association of Black Cardiologists, right. from the Congressional Black Caucus, right. and one or two other organizations, broadly speaking, similar, who stood up and said, they didn't say this, they were much more polite, roughly, sit down, you white anthropologists, you know, just get out of our way. And, mm -hmm. and they would say things, again, much more elegantly than I'm describing, but I'm trying to summarize very quickly. Sure, sure. Look, we need this drug. Uh, maybe everybody needs this drug. Maybe this drug won't work, but, but we want, I've got patients who are dying. And if there's some reason to think this is gonna be efficacious, it's not dangerous, mm -hmm. leave us alone. Yeah, We're, we're gonna do this and we, we get it. We know about eugenics, we know about racial science, we know all of what you were worrying about, but this is something that might make a difference for my patients right. and so calm right. down. Right. And I found it totally fascinating because, partly because I didn't know what the right answer was and partly because these are people, back to the political science side of it, yes. all on the same side of the issue. Right. right. They, These wanted, are they all wanted, wanted better health care for Black people. Better health care for Black people and were passionately committed to racial justice, to never, never, never going back to the old eugenics, racial science, racial hierarchy, white supremacist world that everybody was terrified. That So, so they all agreed, except on this drug. Yes. Um, and so, so that, that's a political dynamic that I found really ex very, very interesting from a scholarly perspective. It's very right. different from the way we normally think about politics. So I was completely hooked. <laughs> no, I, I mean, and it's a fascinating case. Is it, and, and I don't want us to, you know, go too far down into it, but because uh, I want all of you uh, in, uh, on this, uh, on uh, watching us or being with us today to actually read the book because it's worth reading and it's beautifully written. So um, I, I think though that there, um, it, it does raise the issue that I also wanted to, to, for us to talk about a little bit. How do we characterize something called partisanship? Um, I think you do it in a number of ways in the book, partisanship. I, in one moment, I thought I understood it to be, you know, would, would the Republicans, would those who claim to be Republicans hold on to this in a particular way versus those who claim to be independents or claim to be uh, Democrats or leftists versus conservatives or, right. and so did you mean, so how expansive is your notion of partisanship in this? Uh, and, and how did you see it playing itself out? Because you just described one where, I'm, you know, so you, so it's, it's a number of, 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 you know, black professional organizations, physicians, who were like, you know, no, we just want something to help. We would like the benefits of modern medicine to come to black people for a change and help them. And a largely group of white, not only, but not only, uh, anthropologists, uh, uh, sociologists, um, some biologists, uh, some public health experts were disputing saying, but this opens a door that, that would take us down a slippery slope back to racial science. In okay. fact, it is racial science. So, 
um, how, how do you how did you struggle with uh, and, and you build into the book this wonderful frame for trying to grasp where people are on a sort of matrix of of their political personal professional affiliation i'm glad you asked thank you um so so i started with you know partisanship in the narrow conventional sense as you described it democrat and republican the in if you want public opinion surveys two of the big empirical bases for the book are two surveys that i ran and those mostly have a pretty cut and dry definition of you know strong democrat mild democrat independent yeah. Mildly Republican or conservative, strongly conservative or liberal, mildly, you know, so there's a kind of a the assumption that there's a single continuum and you're on one end or the other or something like that. That's pretty much how political scientists tend to study partisanship. We all know that it's radically incomplete, mm -hmm. but 96 percent of Republicans voted for President Trump and 95 percent of Democrats voted for either Hillary Clinton or, you know, so it works exactly. well. So it is useful. <laughs> it, it works pretty well. And, yeah. you know, if you look at a board, if you look at vaccine, well, no, that's a separate conversation. I set that aside. Anyway, <laughs> but but it turns out partly from this vital experience, partly actually from our colleague Henry Lewis Gates' work on racial ancestry testing, partly from talking to people about prenatal testing, it, it doesn't sort that way in right. genomic science, mostly. Right. That there are exceptions, but in the forensic arena, people mm -hmm. are passionately committed to the Innocence Project in which forensic DNA databases exonerate now typically middle-aged or elderly Black men, but they used to be poor, young Black men who had terrible lawyering. Yes, exactly. But forensic DNA databases are disproportionately African-American and Latino, right. of course, also men. So there's a genetic surveillance. So the more I looked at a variety of cases, racial ancestry testing, prenatal testing, forensic DNA databases, vital itself, the more it just didn't sort into a liberal, conservative, democratic, Republican. It just, and if you look at the surveys, it doesn't work. The other thing that made me think that that wasn't going to work was I did a whole bunch of interviews, and I interviewed one quite eminent person who's both himself an, an eminent medical professional, but also pretty high level in the United States government. And he said, when I testify, and I, it was a terrible interview. I couldn't get him to talk about the politics. He uh -huh. just kept saying, no, there's no politics here. This is just science. And I kept saying, no. well, let me try this again. And, and he, he said, look, when I go testify on the Hill, my assistant has to tell me who are the Republicans and who are the Democrats and the committee that I'm testifying before. Uh -huh. I don't know. Uh -huh. I do know which ones of them have a serious medical disease in their family or among their constituents or. Uh -huh. So I walked out thinking, boy, that was a failure of an interview. And I was so excited because this was a really important part. And, and that became in some ways the focal point for making sense of all these conflicts that didn't right. work. Right, right, right. So I ended up with a, with a structure that's very different from that. Um, and again, so without- because Basically you're saying that, you know, it, so what he he astutely uh, or he uh, in, in his practices, he was astute about the fact that bodies and disease and health, uh, there are moments where it transcends labels like or identity categories such as Democrat or Republican or political categories like Democrat. Same with the criminal Republican. justice system. And then you then you get you get, get people sitting on different sides based on family history, personal experience, um, commitment to some other sets of values, but right. it's not simple politics. It's, it's politics, but it's not simple politics. It's absolutely, and it doesn't map well. So my surveys show this, if you actually think about the cases, you're just, same thing in the criminal justice arena. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter, whom I describe as a, you know, radical anarchist feminist, and she says, no, nah, and I say, What's wrong about that? Huh? No, that's about right. Um, <laughs> she was very strongly, well, at least one point in her career, I'm not sure this is true any longer, but at one point she was very strongly in favor of the forensic DNA databases being used in the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. And I thought that didn't fit very well. She has clients who have been raped or mm -hmm. clients who have had terrible violent crimes against members of the family. And her commitment as a radical anarchist feminist leftist was, 
help my clients. Right. The criminal justice system is radically inadequate and terrible and racist and everything else, but these people will be benefited. So again, it, it, when you get to cases, the politics just don't work very well. Yeah, no, well, they don't work. Uh, I mean, I think what you're showing is not so much they don't work well, and they can still work well, but they're not the same kind of politics. Yes, yes, yes. the conventional right. politics of democratic politics. Yeah, and I think you want to, and I think you draw attention to that, to that difference um, very well. And, it, and, and it's connected to um, the other uh, part of the sort of, what's the sides that people sit, sit on with respect to the cases that you bring up. And there's one I wanna to point to that I think is slightly off center from the other ones. But, um, and that is the contestation as you draw out and which anybody studying this would have to draw out is sometimes between those people who believe that race itself and it, it, hearkening back to Bido is a social construction and should not be understood in any way, shape or form in biological terms. And there are sociologists and anthropologists and biologists who and genomicists who believe that very strongly. And there are other people who say, you know what, there are deep biological differences in ape between human groups and those have to be really, and, and to use race, we know it's crude, we know it's not quite right, but we still need it because it actually does tell us something. So you have the social, what we call the social constructive constructionist versus uh, how do I well, how have I would characterize the other side? Um, just uh, people who have a different view of biology, who believe biology is a particular force that is that we can get to through racial categories or ancestry categories. So so that's again a different kind of that's a huge divide. Yeah. Yeah that you speak to. So say, say more about how you, how you came to uh, you just wrestle that one to the ground. Yeah, right. I mean, if I could solve that one, then <laughs> and just, you can just appoint me czar of everything. And I, you know, we're done with this conversation. Um, there you go. <laughs> the, the way I frame it to my students in classes and, and is, is it possible for, at least for Americans and maybe for most of the rest of the world, because we're not particularly different on this issue, to talk about race and biology in the same sentence without blowing up? It, it, not, it, not too often. No, that's right. And, and part of the reason is because we have such a horrendous history. I mean, you know, racial science, eugenics, I mean, we, we all know the terms and, and they, the tips of a very, very big, complicated iceberg. And so we have no usable history in which that conjunction has been demonstrably useful in a way that's not merely white supremacist and, and murderous. Um, and so the question I think, given the two sides you've just described, part of the question is actually the science, which I'm not really competent to talk about. Mm -hmm. My understanding from the geneticists is that, exactly as you said, race is just a very crude indicator. And if we're lucky and smart, in X number of years, X being five or 50, we'll have much better language, a much finer gradation, a much better way of thinking about what genetic characteristics probabilistically cluster in categories of individuals. And we can just jettison this impossibly vague and complicated mm. language of race. So that's one answer is it, it, it may be something. That, that's their hope. That's their hope that's gonna get there, okay. Yeah, you know, no, I'm not saying that necessarily it'll happen, but that's right, exactly. But that is their hope. That is what they express as a hope and aspiration. And I think there's two, so two further comments. One is that some scholars say we're already past the point where that hope is even a possibility. That's true. Yeah. Our, our mental categories are so imbued with, maybe we don't use the word race, we use the word biogeographic ancestry, but it's just five syllables rather than one syllable. <laughs> And so we, as human, just as we, we can't, we're cognitively not capable of getting past that set of categories. Yes. I don't know whether that's true or not. The, the other question, it seems to me. But, um, you, you, is, but that wasn't your question in your work. You weren't trying to find out whether it was true or not, but you were trying, I don't to, know. Out, trying to how that distinction plays itself out. Uh, in politics, exactly. Yes. Um, and, and the other, the last sort of, again, kind of political angle or societal angle on this question that, no, I'm not remotely going to try to answer the real question, <laughs> um, is kind of to what degree can we trust, and this gets back to the underlying structure of the book, that we're past 
the era of racial science and eugenics? Right. Exactly. Have we as a society or we as a culture or we as a political system or we as a world, I mean, again, this is not just the United States, learned enough of a lesson that on balance, we can move in a direction that takes advantage of genetics knowledge without sliding down that slippery slope. And, and right. that's, the, I mean, that's the, I can't think of any more political question than that. Um, and, it's, and it's the heart of the matter. It is the political question at the heart of the scientific enterprise that we call genomics. And do, do we, you know, and, and my answer is sort of, I, roughly speaking, I don't know. I mean, we did elect, Barack Obama twice, yes. and frankly, the second election was in some ways more important than the first as an indication that all of us white folk were willing to have the most powerful guy in the world be black. I mean, twice, but yeah, not except, all except not all Jennifer, but, but, but except Jennifer, the, 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 the question mark that always appeared around Obama, he was being called black when ha one of his parents was white That's and right. one of his parents was African. That's right. Right. So, so. That's right. In certain ways, we were eliding the question of Absolutely. our own understanding of the a broad scale uh, public uh, discussion of his of the, the way the biology played itself out. He was thrown if he he could have easily have been born with the same kind of parents, uh, uh, lighter skinned and oh. presented more white than he did That's black, right. and then he would have been white. <laughs> but, he, but he was the genetics don't tell you that right so absolutely it's, it's, well it's also example. true that he he described himself as multiracial when he was running for office and he described himself as black once he was president so he was playing precisely, this game precisely but that's the game of biology and race in america absolutely i i mean that's that's why this is back to your first question why is a political scientist studying this because there's <laughs> nothing more important i mean you, you can tell Sort of the same story. If you, if you get into the question of gene editing and prenatal testing, and sure. by, you know the, the, well, the, the equally me, deep. Well, let me stop you on prenatal, prenatal moral, testing. political, because, social question there. Of course, there are deep moral and political questions there, and I think that's absolutely right. But I felt that the I, I'm not sure. I think the, the prenatal testing one is. I, I think the prenatal testing one draws us closer into some older notions that 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 uh, historians writing about the history of eugenics point to. The history of eugenics points to points us to sometimes to uh, 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 not just the the ways in which it was uh, uh, abused by uh, I mean it was it was used by the Nazis and in, in, in resulting in the Holocaust, but also the ways in which elites late nineteenth century the ones who were pulling this thing together called eugenics um, saw that there were certain uh, physical and moral and intellectual characteristics that they believed rested solely in certain human bodies and not in other human bodies. And they wanted those to be enhanced. Now they didn't have any way to do any gene editing, but they did think that marrying right, right. Uh, making sure if you're, if you're white, you wouldn't dare cross the color line and, and bring, your, bring your whole family's lineage down into some other level. Actually, you wanna just keep moving up to greater perfection. So the, the interest in human perfectibility is part of the old eugenics. And I think interest in human perfectibility is part of our eugenic life legacy. Yes, I, absolutely. There's no question of that. I mean, I think that's completely right. Um, part of what genomics is doing is broadening that legacy history set of moral conundrum, whatever it is that, that you're describing. Um, I mean, for example, Down syndrome. Yeah, right. Is, right. right. There are many European countries, I think particularly Scandinavian countries, although not uniquely so, but also in the United States, where fewer and fewer, uh, again, the language here is so complicated, unborn children, That's right. fetuses. Sure. Yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to. Whatever the term yeah. is, I'm trying to be as neutral as possible about the exactly. terminology here. Exactly who have been found, who, who prenatal testing demonstrates that they are, have a very high likelihood of being having Down syndrome when born. Right. And a very large proportion of, by now, I believe a considerable majority of those parents, children, uh, parents thank you, are choosing to terminate their pregnancy. 
Right, exactly. That, that again, I'm trying to use language. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. And I don't want anybody listening to this to start, you know, chastising us for our language. In in the book, Jennifer is very, very careful. It's harder to do this in conversation without spending all the time making sure we it's been parsed absolutely correctly. I just wanted to say that. Just I, I, I did work very hard in the book to parse it. So thank you for noticing that. Um because that's not an issue that that I mean the question of abortion and at what point life begins and so on is not directly part of my project. I mean, okay. that obviously it, there were a few issues that are more important than answer, but anyway, but, but the fact that we can now, we collectively as at least Western wealthy societies choose to terminate pregnancies in which a child is likely to be born either with Down syndrome, which is not a horribly painful and early death. I mean, it's a, Right. It is by what, most conventional understandings, it's a disability, but by some people's understanding, it's not a disability. It's just a difference. The difference. Um, and so talk about slippery slopes, right? Yeah. I mean, right. if we if if we believe it appropriate to terminate a pregnancy for for when the child is born, it's going to extremely painful, short, horrible life, one might think that's morally acceptable, but yeah. not for a child with Down syndrome. Exactly. And, and what I, about congenital deafness or what about, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. So, so the prenatal testing raises issues that are certainly attached to the history of racial hierarchy and eugenics and positive eugenics as compared with negative eugenics and all of what you were saying. But it also has something of an independent life that's linked but not identical. No, I agree. I agree. I'm just saying, I, I thought that- and Boy, that's a hard one. <laughs> it's a hard one. I think it's a very hard one. And also because I think the sort of public understanding, uh, and I hope many other people follow your work, because I think it's time for greater public understanding of these nuances that we're trying to finesse in this, this conversation, but that these nuances matter. And I think we've been talking about things like eugenics and that, as I said, that legacy, of human perfect and a desire for human perfectibility, uh, it, it travels in our culture, it travels in our society. And, and how we think about it and how we act on it, uh, I think is, is significantly important and probably, but it's hard to have those conversations if people don't really know how that history has it manifests itself over time. And that takes me to the last question. I, I just want, because we should stop and let people ask some questions, but so what's, your, what, what's the big, big home uh, takeaway uh, point that you, wanted, that you wanted the book to, to bring? Because you end with sort of classifying yourself as a sort of, um, you called yourself, a, a, what'd you say, a mild enthusiast? A cautious, a cautious enthusiast. A cautious, yeah. I'm sorry, a cautious yeah. Enthusiast. Whether that's a complete oxymoron, of course, is a, so. So, I, I'm an academic, so I have to give you two answers. I can't give you just one. Right? <laughs> um, so the, the first answer is more or less what you just said about we need language and we need categories and we need ways to talk about these issues, even if we can't yet resolve it. So that's basically what the book is trying to do. And I have four categories. It's a two by two table. One dimension is what essentially the first half of our conversation was. To what degree does genomics shape important, not, not just individual diseases, but human traits, human behaviors, human possibilities. Yes. And it ranges from, you think it matters a whole lot, do you think it matters maybe some of the time once in a while, do you think it doesn't matter at all? That's roughly speaking the social construction debate. That we, the, the other dimension is kind of risk acceptance and risk aversion. And that's where I was talking about there were both benefits and costs, the old economist for good and for ill. The, Genomics will help solve, cure terrible diseases more or less quicker or slower with or without, you know, but, but that promise is at least is out there. Mm -hmm. Or genomics is basically going to reinvent racial surveillance through technology. It's going to lead to a new eugenics. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so how much risk are you willing to accept in exchange for the benefits that are likely to occur as society uh -huh. gets more yes. and more? Yes. So if you look at it, if it's a two by two table like that, there are kind of four kinds of answers. And yes. one of them is, 
the, the enthusiasts. Yes, yes, genomics matters. And yes, on balance, it's going to be more beneficial than harmful. That's roughly speaking, the sort of the standard yep. geneticists who can't wait to get to their lab in the morning because they want to do good for the world. They're not just trying to make a career and win a Nobel Prize. They actually believe that this is really helpful. A second category is also more or less optimistic, but thinks ge genetics is much less important or not at all. And that's the sort of the social liberal. We, we can solve many of society's problems and we don't need to touch genetics if we just do X, Y, Z. We do the other things, right, sure. All the other stuff that- Create a more equitable society around, exactly. around and, other and, dimensions. And, sure. and genetics is just either irrelevant or unhelpful or, or harmful. Or, or, or slightly helpful. Yeah, a third category are what I quite call skeptics who think, yes, right. genomics matters, but basically it's more harmful than helpful. I, I, it's really risky. So for example, the people who think that prenatal testing is effective, I mean, it's correct. They don't disagree with its science, but they think it's deeply harmful, for example, in the disability community. Sure. And then the final category is people who are what I call rejectors, and they basically don't like anything. That they're, they're deep, they, they think societal intervention is profoundly risky. They think genomic science is profoundly risky. They just leave me alone. Yes. I mean, crudely yes. speaking, it's libertarians, although again, that's a little yeah, too that's, crude. Yeah, that's a little no. problem. So my answer to your question, this is around, I'm getting back to, is that I personally am what I'm calling a cautious enthusiast. I, on balance, I think genomics, genetics matters sometimes in some circumstances in important ways. I mean, again, I've got all kinds of caveats. And on balance, I think I, I want to be an optimist and say that, I don't know whether the physics analogy works here for me or not, uh, it, it's going to do more good that, that I want to be able to believe that people can use it for better more than they are going to use it for the worse. You are an optimist. Well, I, I said I want to. I, I didn't say I believe. I said I want to believe. So uh, I'm okay. a little bit right. okay. okay. All right. I, I, I got it. I, got, I understand the distinction. So my two answers to your question. One is I, I hope that this categorization actually will help people think about these complicated debates. That, well, so. No, I think that, I mean, I, I, I appreciate your answer. And I do think that what you've done is you tried, you've tried to break open what this is a really, it's a really complex set of questions. And we often, um, many, many scholars and researchers write, writing about this, we bracket some of the, some complexities uh, because uh, it's too hard to figure on that one and maybe not too hard and easier to think with the other one. But then again, they're all relate, they're related in some fundamental oh, kind of ways. Intersectional to be right, in, Well, I live in intersectional life, so yeah. So, I mean, I think it's really about uh, uh, helping us to understand that these that in a in a democratic and multi diverse um, society that these are these are, uh, and you know Foucault said it a long time ago and many other people have said it even better than he did uh, governance matters how we govern on these sets of things how we govern ourselves how the expectations we have of our government. Are, are things we're going to have to learn how to think harder about. And, and that's not, exactly my conclusion. My right? final, final answer to your question is, we've all got to engage with this stuff. And we need, we need what I hope are helpful categories for me or other people to develop a language so that we can talk to each other without either just withdrawing into our corners or being totally confused. Precisely. We, we, we want to avoid both. All right. I think I, I think that's a, I think that's a, a, a great answer. It's certainly one that I, I left the book saying I, I really appreciate the way you did the end, where you really, as you said, came out from behind the, uh, <laughs> the uh, curtain at the uh, blind audition, and, and and you know you have at some point you have to take a stand and say what you what you want us to do with all this really fascinating, incredible um, stories that you've told us uh, as a political scientist. <laughs> I got to needle you about that, but I, well, so, I, I, but I, mean, I think it's great. I think it's great. I think now we'll have some shared graduate students. All right. I would love to. Absolutely. Which will be, which will be great, right? Let's do a course together. Okay. I'm ready. Uh, okay. So we have some questions. Uh, let me ask one. Uh, you, uh, this one is, you talked a bit about how difficult it is to hold these discussions, given the weighty charged nature of the topic. Do you have a recommendation for ways to have these conversations? 
without delving into uh, non-productive emotional back and forth. Well, I think we just did that. And what do you think uh, about that question? Yeah, well, one answer is, of course, it's really hard. And once again, if I had the right answers, somebody would make me czar or something about that. Um, I, I think what I want to encourage is that this doesn't, that most of these conversations, again, abortion politics is a little bit different, but most of these conversations don't fit neatly into the set of categories we typically use in politics. Mm -hmm. And if, if each of us can think about our own, it doesn't have to even be ambivalence, the, our, own, our own complex response, mm -hmm. like you know the forensic databases, well, I don't like the government surveilling poor young black men and Latinos, but I sure do like the Innocence Project. Um, yeah. And so if I can recognize my own mixed views, mm -hmm. maybe I can accept the idea that somebody else will have mixed views. Be because this topic is not fixed in standard political categories, it gives us some space for engaging with our own uncertainties and therefore maybe with other people's. Yeah, and I think I think I think what you've illuminated about political categories is is right. But I think there's one that that I think over my experience of working on this these sets of questions for for such a long time, it's often there's also a, a problem of whose expertise really matters. And one of the things that's happened in ways funding of this of, of genomics research, the funding for basic research in genomics, it, it, it's it's very expensive and it, and it has cost a lot to move it to the point where it is now. There's nothing equal to that in funding of the social sciences. Right. And that's a problem. And I think right. actually more funding for the social sciences. So there's not so much of a power imbalance of who gets to say that we actually experience. And that's what part of the question has come up that uh, and written to us twice. Who should have a voice on governance here? Yeah. Uh, who will have a voice? And why does and I would add, and why does that matter? What's your perspective on that? Because I'm concerned about that. I think, um, you know, the reason we have the ethical, legal, and social implications, uh, LC, we shorthand LC studies that that were funded out of some of the money for the Human Genome Project, except it was a tiny slice of money, but it was the most money that ethical and ethics and legal and social science scholars had ever gotten for that kind of work. But it was still just a tiny drop in the bucket compared to the money that went into sequencing the human genome. Now, I think sequencing the human genome was an amazing and incredible and absolutely uh, uh, incredible uh, uh, success, right? But we, we can't keep making the sort of basic science get so much money. And then we, we think that the social and legal and ethical implications, well, we'll figure it out. We'll figure that out, kind of. It, it, it deserves more. The balance is off, in my view. Yeah, and, I, and so the, your question of governance and, and that you raise in the book several times, I think is a really crucial one. Who's going to be at the table? How, we, how, do, we, how do we sit the eminent Nobel Prize winning scientist next to uh, the person who's saying, you know what? My basement, Ida showed up last week and, and we lost everything because nobody's dealing with climate change. I mean, I, I'm going to tell you where my heart is and my interests are. How do we put these people together then? Well, you know, I mean, it, there are sort of somewhat sort of technical answers, citizens advisory groups, citizen yep. science, community DNA days. Right. Much more education in high schools and college, uh, it, you know, I, and I'll. All of that seems entirely appropriate, but it also feels like an insufficient answer to the bigger, deeper point that you're raising. I think part of the answer, I, I have to say, I think part of what happened with the LC research is that it ended up in very high powered, very sophisticated philosophy departments and people, a whole new scholarship around bioethics developed, but it didn't, it hasn't had much of an impact on public discourse. No, I agree. About genomics. So, so I think more funding, um, and certainly more funding for you and me um, and, and our <laughs> colleagues, but, but it needs a much more explicit and directed channeling, frankly, away from some of academics and into communities. 
communities or at least organizations. I mean, so, so I have, I think a couple of other answers. One is the point that you made a long time ago, and not a long time ago, a while ago in this conversation is that families, that, that many people have very direct and immediate relationship to either medical genomics or criminal justice right. or ancestry right. or some. So, so that gives them a standing to sit at the table with a Nobel laureate and say, look, I don't understand what your science is, but, but let me explain why this issue is so important and so frankly difficult for my family, my community, my, and, and unlike, for example, physics, yeah. where people have a very difficult time, not just relating it to their person. I mean, I mean something more serious. No, 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 no. They, they really do. I mean, it's, it's, it's a basic, it's a kind of physics takes you into the world trying to understand, you know, how the world we inhabit all, all inhabit together, how it actually works. It has long-term sometimes, you know, explicit uh, uh, benefits that you can look to, including cell phones and all kinds of things. But um, th that's not, as, that's not as, doesn't have that, um, it, it, it often is not presented in ways that touch people's lives so completely and so many people's lives. And, and I mean, you know, we all have a genome, right? I mean, by yeah, definition, exactly. genomics is a profoundly democratizing science in the sense that some version of genomics, I don't want to say it's shaped my life because that takes us back to the question of biological causes, but, but uh, you know, I mean, the person sitting at the table with a Nobel laureate has just as much of a genome as a Nobel laureate does, right? I mean, and, and so there's a kind of a uh, legitimacy to citizen engagement in a way that some other sciences, I think, don't have built into their yeah. very nature in a way. I, that I, I think I, I don't think that's an unfair characterization. I mean, you know, um, but I do think that uh, also the, the benefits um, are so uh, in many respects seem so, uh, again, personal and immediate. Uh, in the last 18 months, we went from a, a disease, uh, uh, an infectious disease that uh, little was known about to one that we know so much more about in 18 months. And because of some developments in genomics have some vaccines and vaccines are, and in the history of vaccines, they were notoriously long to pull out and make and make a use. Okay. Yeah. And so the fact that this happened rapidly is due to science and technology. Yeah, and that the, the other governance answer I would give just real quickly is there's a kind of an intermediate layer in society between the experts and the legislators and the, you know, people like you and me who are family members and who have some, you know, community society engagement. Um, there's a whole level you might call civil society or organizational society. I mean, this is an issue, again, in which not just schools and colleges and universities, but certainly they, churches, other religious organizations, um, yes. you know, there's a whole level, a whole mid range of organizations, childcare. Right. It, because it reaches so widely, it, all society has a legitimate place at that table. Uh, I think I, I think it's I think that's right. On the other hand, I think one of the things we don't know how to do well is once we get people at the table, how we deal with some of the power imbalances uh, that our structure so far, our societal structure so far, have built into them about whose voice is going to matter the most. This is why the vaccine issue keeps coming back and disturbing people like me, because part of what the people who are vaccine skeptics are saying is some version of what you just said. Why should I believe those scientists? They've been wrong so much. So, I know what I'm gonna put in my body and <laughs> go jump in a lake if you don't like it. Exactly. And I have a hard time saying that they're wrong. I mean, I, 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 have, I have an easy time saying that they're wrong, but, but the moral claim of my legitimate right not to listen to what those experts and authorities are telling me I ought to be doing is, is a hard claim to, it's a power imbalance. It, it, on the yeah. wrong side. 
come, we come to a conundrum right at the end of our time. But ah. you know, and, and there's one other really good question I, uh, uh, on the table that that uh, that's been raised about you know what a question about what genomics we can talk about what genomics can do and might do and other things that we can't even imagine it could do, but but we also have to constantly pay attention to what it can and cannot explain. And I think that's at the heart of, as well, uh, this part of this, uh, uh, of this uh, complicated uh, nuance situation that we, that set of conversations we need to be having in a democratic, diverse society. So Jennifer, with that, I'll let you have the last word and then we have to close it up. Uh, well, I'd be happy to continue this for another six or eight hours if anybody, um, but or you want. Um, so I think that what we what it can't explain, I think there's a, a very important, slightly technical answer, and then an, maybe an even more important, more kind of social and moral answer. The slightly important technical answer is, that in fact, genomics can't explain very much about what we mostly care about. Intelligence, uh, musical ability, athletic ability, compassion, Wisdom, I mean, all the things that really matter. Genomics has maybe 100 years from now, we'll have more to say about it. But right now, it, it, it doesn't touch, you know, most of most traits and behaviors that people care passionately about. Um, and the genomicist, I think, as far as I can tell, really, that the even deeper answer of what it can explain is, is a, I'm not a particularly religious person, but there's a whole kind of, I don't know, spiritual, I mean, there's a whole realm of life, of society, of history, of culture, of values that, that don't reduce to material structures. Let's mm -hmm. even imagine that genetics could explain, say, intelligence or compassion or musical ability. Sure. Even that is, you know, if, if you have religious faith or you have some sense of mystery, this doesn't get at that. It's material. It's materialistic. Yeah, yeah. and so there, there, will, there will be philosophers who will go at this continuously as they already have. And okay. there'll be, uh, but I do think what, what I think what your, what your book is doing is, is a, it's a real contribution to this discussion, Thank these you. discussions. And uh, I'm so happy we had a chance to briefly uh, uh, really highlight some of, some, of, some of your major points. So I am, I am required to say, uh, you know, we've, we've taken our last question. We we're at the end of our time. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you so much to the Harvard Bookstore for inviting me to be in conversation with somebody I love talking to anyway. Well, when we teach this course, we'll continue this conversation. Fine. <laughs> Thank you very much. I've been a total delight, Evelyn. Thank you. Thank you. Too. Thank you both. That was really just absolutely illuminating. Um, and I, yeah, could have kept listening to that for much longer than the hour that we had, um, but I'm so glad we had this hour and uh, thank you both for being here. Uh, thank you all for watching. Uh, please check out this important book on harvard.com. I have dropped the link in the chat a couple of times, um, or you can just find it by going to harvard.com and searching for genomic politics. Um, Anyway, I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. On behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, keep reading and be well. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you all very much. Take care.